in order to have that full life cycle marketing POV, you really need the folks over at product on your side, right? I'm a big proponent of no one should know the introductory funnel quite like a user acquisition professional, right? No one should know what happens that D0 to D30 quite like someone in UA because you need to know what you're showcasing in the app. You need to know what your big KPIs are. Today is a super special day for Mobile Heroes Uncensored. We're always talking to stars, of course, but there are some days that just really stand out. Hello and welcome. My name is John Katsir. My co-host, of course, is Peggy Ansaltz, who is a star in her own right. This is Mobile Heroes Origin Stories, where we go in-depth, one-on-one with mobile marketing experts. And usually... Let's be honest, you can count the age of a company that we're chatting to, a guest that works at, on one hand, you know, maybe two hands, this is mobile after all. But today's guest is from a company that was founded in 1979. It's kind of outrageous for a company in the mobile game space. Just one of their titles would give their name away, but they have multiple iconic game franchises. One of them is Tony Hawk. Ever heard of it? The other is Crash Bandicoot. And the big kahuna, of course, is Call of Duty. Peggy, who are we chatting with? Just about to say, John, you know, I'm binging Stranger Things currently. And one of the years in it is 1979. So I'll look for a look at that. One of those games will be in there. Yes, indeed. We have a veteran in many ways because we have Chanasi Chalkiadakis. He is Senior Manager, Growth Strategy at Activision. Yes, it brought us Call of Duty, but he brings us more because growth and relationships are the story of his life. You wouldn't know it, maybe, John, to look at him, but his life is all about <laughs> being with family. He started his family's restaurant where knowing your customer, of course, was the first step to repeat purchases, shall we say, of a different kind. At Activision, he's all about acquiring high value players to fuel growth and retention. His career there started in mobile, rather, at Disruptor Beam, where he was UA manager. After that, he worked at Scopely as senior user acquisition manager before moving to GSN Games, where he was a UA manager and team lead. And he's not just interested in growth, driving growth. He loves driving, period. He has his own <laughs> podcast as well, Money Shift, bringing us cool automotive news and reviews. And I want to say he won a new viewer because my cousin, who's also Call of Duty, right, and my husband are all in. And I don't know about you, John, but I have a new appreciation of all the joys and features of the Ford Maverick. Thanks to Tanasi, because I went back and looked at the back catalog. So it's great to have you, Tanasi. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And I'll, your $10 is in the mail. Uh, <laughs> so $10, that's mail. 100 dude, inflation. 100. <laughs> I know. Well, I'll have to see if I can scratch some mention, money from the couch. Maverick plug here, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll get Ford on that as well. Exactly. <laughs> and so in prep with Peggy, you said you always wanted to be a mobile hero. I mean, you know, we get that. I mean, who doesn't, right? But why <laughs> specifically did you want to be a mobile hero? Yeah, so I have had the opportunity to work with a couple uh, mobile heroes in the past. Margarita Vasilevskaya is one of the big ones. And it just always stood out to me as like a core pillar of an achievement in the mobile UA space, right? Actors have the Oscars. We have mobile heroes. So for me, that was always something that I was striving for, for sure. You're here. You made it. You're at the <laughs> summit. How does it feel? <laughs> I'm, so I'm getting married in a month, and I, I'll be honest, it's similar feelings to that. Don't, don't tell my fiancé in the sense that I'm equating these two. But what I'm trying to say is it sort of didn't feel real until it was, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I got nominated, went through the whole process. That was super great. But now seeing the publications and other things come out of this, it's sort of really becoming real, much like I'm sure – my wedding isn't going to hit me until the day of that. Wow, this is actually happening. So yeah, no, it feels great. 
this is going on the business card, Peggy. This is going on the business card. He's going <laughs> to walk up to people at the wedding. You know, I'm a mobile hero. You know, just yep, so you it. know, I'm a mobile hero. I left the spandex at home just for the wedding. Totally. But, you know, total mobile hero. Okay, let's dive into the actual stuff we're going to talk about here. What is it like working on mobile growth at Activision? Yeah, I think the intro says it all, right? This is a company that's been around since 1979 and crosses not only PC, but console. And then under the same umbrella, there's also King with Candy Crush, right? So there's various levels of experience and massive titles here. So having the opportunity to work with these really, really large IPs, uh, something I'm used to, at least on the TV side, working with like Star Trek and Walking Dead and things like that, but never a sort of owned IP, like mm -hmm. a Call of Duty and the magnitude that that brings something on par with or actually exceeding things like a Marvel. It's pretty, pretty incredible. One other thing that's incredible is your background. I hinted at it at the start, right? Because you started out at your parents' restaurant and your life has been like my big fat Greek wedding. Your life will be in a month, my <laughs> big fat Greek wedding when you Truly. have your wedding. <laughs> what? has been your career progression. Tell me about that. Yeah, my big fat Greek wedding is 100% correct. Parents were immigrants from Greece to the States, started out in the restaurant, you know, at the ripe age of 12, working with different customers and things of the like, manning the register, doing the whole nine. But post-college, I started out doing marketing for colleges and universities with an agency, which was great. It was sort of a trial by fire, as most agencies are. But my two passions really are gaming and automotive. So I was always looking for a way to get in that field. A uh, small, super small gaming company at the time, Disruptor Beam popped up. They're a company that makes titles with popular TV shows. So there was a Star Trek title, a Walking Dead title, a Game of Thrones title. And that was really what thrusted me into the mobile realm. Uh, never looked back from there. So it was a ton of fun to be at Disruptor Beam, this small sort of scrappy startup in central Massachusetts of all places for a gaming company. From there, I went to LA as most growth managers do. It's either LA or San Francisco, right? For a short stint. I chose the better weather and the slightly cheaper cost of living, I would say. <laughs> that might get some argument, but it is what it is. But my ties are always East Coast. So I had the opportunity to move back East working with car gurus and GSN. And then it, it feels very weird to say, and I don't mean this to sort of put COVID in a positive light, but thanks to COVID opening up work from home as a potential permanent uh, ability or something to do, I had the opportunity to reach out and work with former coworkers and join the Activision ship working on Call of Duty mobile products. You also had the opportunity to draw from your growth marketer background to really thinking about how to keep players coming back. Now that doesn't come naturally. That comes from somewhere. Tell me about the talents, the traits, what has helped you become not just a better growth marketer, but a marketer overall that's looking at, again, the entire life cycle. Totally. Honestly, and this is going to sound super corny to <laughs> say, but for me, the restaurant experience early on was sort of that cornerstone that helped build everything else. Interfacing and working with, you know, net new people as a 12 year old really gave me a lot of confidence to try to bridge a lot of gaps that some other folks potentially might not, right? Like I think a lot of folks are potentially hesitant to sort of send that Slack message to someone on another side of the org or speak up in a meeting with folks that aren't just UA people or marketing folks, depending on what org you're in. But doing that at 12 and interfacing with random people just started that sort of curious nature to be confident enough to ask and, and to deal with whoever, whenever, with whatever at a really early age. So as much as I didn't like it at the time, I'm going to be honest with you, there was nothing worse than leaving grade school to go to work instead of your friend's sleepover. I'm very thankful for, for that now and what it was able to help me achieve. Mom and dad are proud. Um, <laughs> there was some good <laughs> in that. That's awesome. And I'm getting super hungry. It's almost lunchtime where I am. <laughs> Greek food is literally the best. I mean, there's uh, nothing better than chicken souvlaki, right? Is there anything better in the world than chicken souvlaki? Uh, Peggy, you got to say yes. I mean, come on. Uh, but anyway. I'm a just picky person myself, I have to say. <laughs> okay. Both people with exquisite palates uh, already, <laughs> I can tell.
So you grew up with that sense of community, but you've also built that into a passion for life cycle marketing. Talk about life cycle marketing here and why that matters to you, why you focus on that. Yeah, for me, now more than ever, uh, every point of the funnel is very important, especially with larger titles like a Call of Duty. I can say with a high degree of certainty that we've probably hit every single big Call of Duty fan out there, right? This game has been out there for three years. We have a decent marketing budget. And as a result, it's safe to say that we're using all the big platforms, the liftoffs, the other folks of the world, that we've hit these folks that just Call of Duty is in their blood. So now once you get past year two or three, it becomes more than that. Not only are you trying to get more net new people, but you're also trying to find ways to keep those folks engaged, right? So it's different marketing campaigns that are tailored towards those folks to bring them back in. You're really completing that circle. It's not just the net new, but it's, you know, your diehard faithful that just haven't played for a while and you need to showcase or want to showcase the new things that they maybe would love and would love to reincorporate into their lives. So the life cycle aspect becomes more and more important, especially when you're dealing with large titles like a Call of Duty, but it's important for all games. Honestly, it's a lot easier post year three to reacquire your faithful users than it is to find that net new to plug that gap. So for me, it is super important. Do you have to interface significantly with product there? I'm just thinking personally of a mobile game that I play and somehow I've gotten into this thing where my scores aren't totaling up anymore and I keep getting set against uh, battles against these really beginning weak players and I'm murdering them. I'm literally on like a 40 game win streak right now and it's killing me. <laughs> I mean, I'm winning, that's good, <laughs> but it's not fun. I mean, if you're talking life cycle marketing and you want a player for months or years, not days, are you talking to product and working with them regularly? Definitely. And I think this speaks to the, my life is my big fat Greek wedding even more so. I think in order to have that full life cycle marketing POV, you really need the folks over at product on your side, right? I'm a big proponent of no one should know the introductory funnel quite like a user acquisition professional, right? No one should know what happens that D0 to D30 quite like someone in UA because you need to know what you're showcasing in the app. You need to know what your big KPIs are. So you should know those tutorial moments, those gotcha moments, all of that. You should have all of that baked out. But past D30, that's sort of been optional for the UA person. Right? Like, I, I don't necessarily need to know what event is six months down the road, but you bet your bottom dollar that someone from product does. So, combining that POV, speaking with them routinely, understanding how the long term sort of propositions of this game evolve really helps you as a marketer then complete that life cycle. Without that conversation, without that narrative, without that interaction, whatever you wanna call it, it's impossible for you to efficiently retarget, re-engage and bring back folks. Cause you can work in new events, you can work in new skins, new tournaments, what have you, but you wouldn't be able to do so if you're not interfacing with the folks over on product. What's the biggest misconception you've seen that marketers have around life cycle marketing? Hmm. I think, yeah, I think one of the biggest misconceptions folks have on life cycle marketing is that it's just net easy and it's solo. I'm going to double, triple, quadra down on this, right? You just need to talk to your other teammates. They're great people. They want to talk to you as well. What I've found is every time I interface with someone on the product side, if they don't know what user acquisition is, they want to know. And then when they know, they do things differently, you do things differently, you're communicating, you're learning your own metrics because you're communicating to someone who maybe has never heard them before. And then at the same time, they're commuting their efforts to you. So overall, it's just, it's something that is really huge. UA isn't this siloed beast. We're not the people in the back closet that get the scraps at the end of the day and just told no light, no windows. You know, we're, <laughs> we're people too, and we're part of the team. So we should interface with folks across the org as a result. We're people too. That's the new model. <laughs> you are people too. <laughs> totally. So you talk about what it's like, you know, working with a team, communicating, and you're thinking about ways to win back people like John. You have to get better totally. players to play him, to get him back. So it's all about, you know, communicating in many directions. 
Now, I'd like to dive a bit deeper into the tactics here. It's one thing to get him a great opponent, right? But it's another to get his cohort excited. So tell me a little bit about the ad creatives that work best at different stages of the player adventure. Totally. Yeah. So the net new user, right, benefits from really two distinct types. We're talking gameplay where you're showcasing specifically what the title has to offer, or you're talking about these flashy cinematics that bring people in because they're intrigued by the message that you're portraying. There's a lot of companies that do this well outside of Activision. We see Supercell has awesome TV ads that don't necessarily show gameplay, but it's really, really interesting. And you want to be a mm. part of that org, right? And then as you sort of get to the later portion of a player's life cycle where you want to bring them back in your messaging shifts right they know the gameplay they played it oftentimes when you're retargeting people you're bringing back the johns of the world that are your your clear players they know everything about the game they've spent in the game hopefully or if they haven't they're close to that right so what you're showcasing in your creative is probably like three different things it could be different skins maybe you're bringing back a legacy character that was very popular two years ago that now they have the opportunity to put back in their arsenal maybe these are people that are collectors right and having that option to get something legacy is very appealing but then there's also tournaments maybe there's an event right a clash of titans a clash of champions right where you're targeting all of these high value players and this is their chance to sort of showcase why they are what they are in the game their status right you're sort of playing on that on that role and then the last is just if there's anything net new in the product itself right maybe there's a new feature maybe there was a previous pain point i know on the disruptor beam side back in the day we had this collector sorter Star Trek Timelines was very much a game where you wanted to collect all of the Star Trek characters, right? If you are a big fan of Star Trek, you wanted them all, but you had no proper way to sort through them. So when we implemented a sorting feature, we showed that in creative and it brought back people, right? Because it's a quality hmm. of life improvement. So you're sort of thinking outside of this gameplay cinematic box and trying to find ways that appeal to folks to bring them back in. I to understand... I'm just curious to tell you the truth, because you're talking about it in such depth. You must have like your your favorite ad creative or your ad creative formula for nailing it at a certain stage. What can you share there? Maybe even walk me through one. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, I've talked about this in the past, that it, it probably bears repeating, that ad creative overall sets the tone for a lot of targeting and campaigns. Right now, mm -hmm. more than ever, a lot of targeting is getting pulled back. We're losing a lot of it. The Facebook and the Googles of the world are removing it, which is totally fine. But now it shifts the levers that we have to pull. And a lot of that is creative. So for myself, because it's so dependent on title, it's more thematic. What theme are you trying to go for in the creative itself? What is what what's the point of it? Is it to showcase really cool gameplay? Then it's an awesome gameplay sizzle reel. Is it to showcase your IP? Then it's a really cool cinematic trailer that plays and harps on the characters like the folks over at Supercell do well, like the folks at Blizzard do really well with Hearthstone and, and Diablo and, and things like that, right? Or is it something else? Is it a feature? Is it something that makes their lives easier? Maybe it's a the coolest flashlight app in the world, right? There's something to be said for that too. So I think for me, there's no necessarily creative silver bullet it's more just mm -hmm. what is the point of the ad that you're trying to make and do that as best you can right if you can have that sentence in your head i want this ad to get x then you can sort of put that to paper and it's not just i want people to buy in my app it's more than that you want you want folks to get more feelings there that's a really smart rule of thumb and distilling something really complex that could be many, many shows down into these three rules. I mean, if anything, that's the takeaway here. But of course, if you're going to get a player, you need to fish where the fish are. Share a little bit. What have you found to be the best channels to show off that cinematic, awesome ad creative we're talking about? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think for, for me, I'm not going to give any shocking answers here. 
right? Okay. If you're in the user acquisition world, you know who the top players are and it's no secret. And I think the innovation comes how you approach them, but it's really, you know, the social networks of the world, the Google, Facebook, TikToks, I think the DSPs mm -hmm. now more than ever are more valuable, more important. The liftoffs of the world that are able to acquire at scale is something that a lot of folks are looking for because I think today, given how automated some of the features of user acquisition are, these teams are running leaner than ever. You have teams of one to five that are operating multi-million dollar budgets at some companies, and they wouldn't be able to do so if they didn't have confidence in a liftoff to be able to spend a lot with. So for me, I think those are those would probably be the big three, the social networks, the DSPs, and then probably YouTube for ancillary brand efforts. Uh, mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily tied to ROAS. But yeah, I, I would probably put those three up there. Cool. So, so far we've chatted about awesome stuff, what you've done and your thoughts and strategies and stuff like that. Let's turn the focus a little bit on you because, hey, you're the mobile hero. So we're going to do that in some origin story. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so... What has been your biggest accomplishment in your career? The one thing that you did, hey, that moved the needle, that jumped the metrics that you just felt really good about? Yeah, for me, it was probably proving out the thesis that creative drives targeting. Uh, that was a really, really big one. A lot of the networks in the world like to say, hey, it's creative best practices or X, Y, and Z, and they aren't wrong right? That that's what works for their platform. They've proven it. They've done all of these things, but to find different ways that maybe make your title stand out was something that really made me proud. And that was that creative sets the tone for targeting. That might not sound like this crazy, you know, like he's not actually saying anything. There's four wheels on a car. Yeah, we all know that. But, <laughs> it, it, but to see it in practice at scale, was something that was really neat where when you show a cinematic trailer, you get more, you get more click throughs through that, right? A lot of people find it flashy. They think it's very interesting. They want to see what it is, but maybe your retention is a lot lower. Like that tends to be the case, right? Because they get in under one premise and then they see the title and, and that's not the case. So you're paying less for them, but they're retaining lower. But then on the other side for the gameplay focused campaign, you're paying a lot more for the user, two, maybe three X, but the retention is a lot higher. But when you put them both together, you don't get that middle ground. So having them separate for me was pretty important at the time. And it's, it wasn't the case for all networks. I think like folks have said a bajillion times, testing, testing, testing really is key, right? Find out what mix works for you and where that sort of methodology can fit in place. But for me, the, the proud moment was finding where it fit into place and finding it at scale, which unlocked sort of like a second tier, if you will, of spend that we could use on that platform. I think that is insightful, actually. And I think that's something that people are turning to as, as you said earlier, the black boxes, the algorithms are controlling so much of what's going on in UA. Creative is the thing that you still can, can control, although obviously that can be automated as well to some totally. degree. Uh, the more brand focused you are, the less you're going to do that, but it can be done. Uh, but we've heard a couple people who are pretty significant saying, you know, they're actually doing a lot of targeting with their creative right now. And that is interesting. Love it. Yeah, no, I agree. It's more important than ever. And I think for a lot of folks, I don't know about yourselves, but when I was in school with a marketing degree, I never thought that it would lead to what I call UA sometimes, which is Excel, right? I never thought it would lead to that. In my mind, it was always the flashy TV ads or newspaper ads and things like that. And that part of UA now is getting bigger than ever, the, the UA creative portion is becoming a larger impact more so than I think it ever was, which is really awesome. Speaking of awesome, you have an awesome job, Tanasi. You really do. You know, it's fun. It's more creative. You said yourself, it's not death through Excel anymore. And for some, it's a dream job, you know, being a mobile hero. Here you are. So there are people who want to be like you. What's your top advice to marketers who want a career in growth in a gaming company? Maybe someday being a mobile hero just like you. What would you tell them? Uh, access to information now more than ever is huge. I, it's no secret to say that 
you can find a lot of information on user acquisition out there, whether it's different podcasts like this one or other just articles, right? Peggy, God knows there's a lot. If, if someone just searched your name in the Google search bar and read every single one of the articles that you have written, they would be way further ahead than I was when I started uh, in this space. And I think that access to information is alone a really, really huge thing that is available to people that are looking to break into this industry. I would say the second of which, though, are events and chat rooms that you could sort mm -hmm. of bump shoulders with industry professionals that aren't available in a lot of other industries. You can go into mm -hmm. different mobile hero Slack rooms and interface with these titans in the industry that have been in it longer than I have. You can go to events that happen in most cities, right? From Kansas to LA to New York, there's an app growth or a mobile growth or something that you can go and get involved and meet the people that can get you into those same positions. And then the last of which now it's wherever you are. I'm in Massachusetts now and I work for Activision who's based in California. So if you thought at one point that your location limited your ability to get a job in the gaming industry, specifically marketing, that's not the case. There's folks every day that are advertising full remote from Activision to Bungie to whoever, right? These are folks that are committed to offering and bringing in the best people regardless of where they are, which is something that wasn't the case two or three years ago. So now more than ever is the opportunity for you, wherever you are, to get mm -hmm. into the gaming space. And also, you know, I think I speak for John as well, that we enjoy educating the space and having the podcast. And ourselves. And, <laughs> that. and, uh, and we're, on, we're on the Slack channel. We're over at Mobile Heroes as well. So, you know, you can bump and connect with us there totally. as well. So it's just, it's just great to hear you say that that is where everyone who wants to be like you needs to go. <laughs> Thank you. Exactly. Definitely. <laughs> well, let's end here. Um, we always ask our mobile heroes for one top tip and let's ask you your top tip for marketers who are looking to grow their mobile games in the second half of 2022. The top tip, the silver bullet, right? Yep. Uh, I would say it is if folks take anything away from this conversation, it is that creative dictates your strategy more so than ever. And having an understanding of the why to the creative that you're producing will give you the answer that'll drive growth to your product. If you are able to create advertisements for your game that answer a specific question, whether it's where they can play it, whether it's how they can play it, whether it's uh, how they monetize even, who knows, right? Whatever that answer is for your product, you will create a better ad that drives a more qualified user in your game because the advertisements you're making are answering a specific question. It's focused, it's not scatterbrained, it's not all over the place. And that's probably one of the things that I would say that could help folks hopefully grow all their games or mobile apps in the latter half of this year. Excellent, thank you so much. It has been a real pleasure. Totally. Thank you both. Appreciate the time. This has been awesome. I have to thank you really for distilling that into such simple terms. You know, the ad creative is back in your control. It's empowering. It's a positive way to end the show. So thanks, Nasi. Great to have you. Thank you. And thank you to all listeners. We really do appreciate you. Hope you're enjoying it. Let us know on social if you are. And let us know if you want to come and We'll have you on the show. If you're a mobile hero or you know of someone who is, then fill out the interest form over at shorturl.at forward slash JKSKT. Also, Liftoff has a Slack for mobile heroes and people in the mobile ecosystem. There's a link on the screen. And if you're listening to the podcast, it's at info.liftoff.io slash slack dash sign up. It's pretty cool. There's smart people there, and you know what? They probably need you, too. And you have probably been completely blown away by all the insights on this show, and you want your transcript, and you can have it because the transcripts are over at Liftoff's website. Go to liftoff.io, click on Heroes, and then click on Podcast. I actually personally love transcripts because I read way faster than people talk, so that's a great way to get insights really, really quickly. 
Until next time, this is John Kutz here. Thank you so much for joining. And this is Peggy Ann Saltz signing off for Mobile Heroes Uncensored. <laughs>